Welcome to the party. I'm Sam Ekstrom of Lockdown Sports Minnesota, and I'm thankful for, as I'm sure you all are as well, Creed on this pre-Thanksgiving. Yeah, Luke Inman at Luke underscore Spinman. Uh, Sam, I got a lot to be grateful for this year, but I got to say, winning this signed Ron Johnson gem mint upper deck card really takes the cake. <laughs> Nothing else needs to be said. It's the Minnesota football party. Locked on Sports Minnesota podcast. It's endless Minnesota Vikings talk with the diverse voices of your local experts. It's time for the Minnesota football party. Welcome in to a Thursday edition, a Thanksgiving edition of the Minnesota Football Party on Locked On Sports Minnesota. A little bit of a skeleton crew for the holiday. That's okay. I'm Sam Ekstrom. That's Luke Inman. Ron Johnson joins along the way. We're going to have a lot of fun. Hope you're enjoying your Thanksgiving and holiday weekend, maybe watching some football. You're double, double screening it, watching football on the TV, watching our show on Locked On Sports Minnesota on the phone or laptop. We're also on audio, the Locked On Vikings audio feed, wherever you get your podcast. Today's program is brought to you by uh, Prize Picks, the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL and use code all lowercase locked on NFL for a first deposit match up to $100. Plenty to get to today. The Vikings are six and five. They are in playoff position. They've got the Bears coming up on Monday. We're talking Chicago. We're talking about this matchup as the Vikings try to start a new winning streak. I want to get into X-Factor Brandon Powell, who's been a nice surprise these past few games without Justin Jefferson, KJ Osborne banged up. What is What kind of role has he played himself into? And I want to look down the road about a post-Brian Flores defense. If indeed he does not last beyond one year, what does that defense look like? And Ron Johnson will weigh in on all of these highly controversial questions as well. But Luke Inman, happy Thanksgiving to you. Um, the Vikings trying to deliver a uh, after the holiday weekend with a Monday night win against the Bears. I guess, um, what are your thoughts at this point, kind of midweek with this Vikings-Bears matchup? Yeah, I think predicting this game, Sam, it's a little tough for me because there's this pattern here with this Bears team. I'm starting to see again, going back to last year to now where last year, if you remember, they really started out putrid. Actually, they started out two and one, but offensively, man, they were absolutely atrocious. There were stages where Fields had like more scrambles than he had completions or dumb stats like that super early in the year. But then a switch flipped and it was like, okay, Fields, he's unstoppable with his legs. He started hitting more chunk plays downfield. And it was like, okay, this team might not win a lot of games this year, but they're going to be competitive every game. And don't be surprised when they drop 30 points every other week. That's kind of what it turned into last year with the Chicago bears this year before Fields got hurt in the Vikings game, no less. If you remember, he came into that game putting up some huge stats, back-to-back -back games, Washington and Denver. And now after seeing what he did coming back last week and how he looked versus Detroit, I just feel like we're at that point again, Sam, where you know this team, win or lose, is going to be competitive from here on out, assuming, of course, Fields can stay healthy for this final stretch. So I think as much as we bag on the Bears, you can't just chalk this game up as an easy win. Division game, always tough. This was a team that knocked the Vikings out of the playoffs week 17 when they had nothing to play for at U.S. Bank Stadium, no less, just a few years ago. So I expect a tough matchup here, and it's going to be a close game that – Comes down to the cliches, weird, stop me if you've heard this one, turnovers, right? But um, it's it's just a game where I see coming down to a handful of plays that's going to dictate this one in the end between, a, a you know, the difference between a win and a loss. And I think on paper, yeah, the Vikings should win this one. I mean, the line's three and a half for a reason. That's with or without JJ, which we'll get into. But I just, mm -hmm. I expect this Bears team to be a tough out for everyone from here on out these last six weeks. You look at the fine line between success and failure in the NFL, and the Vikings Bears are a good example. The mm -hmm. Bears have been atrocious, and the Vikings have had their number past few years, home and road. But even in that, almost all of them are tight, right? Like earlier this year, Tyson Bagent is driving to win the game. You need to come up with a pick. Last year, Justin Fields 
driving to tie the game. Amir Smith-Marset gets stripped. Year before that, Vikings needed a, a fourth down stand in the red zone to win by eight in Chicago. Like all of these games are still close, even as bad as the Bears are. You know, the Lions set a very high bar, Luke, because year two of their rebuild, this is right when they turned it on. Thanksgiving and after last year, mm -hmm. the Lions got some momentum and carried it over into this season. They turned the switch right now. I feel like the Bears aren't there yet. I feel like the Bears are not going to have a Lions-esque rise late in this season. I don't think their roster is there. And I think maybe we got a little bit fooled by some unsustainable rushing success by Justin Fields last year. Like, And, and, and I feel the same way about Christian Watson with the Packers. Sometimes when, some, when a player does unbelievable things, particularly scoring from long distances a lot of times in a row, that's not going to continue into the next year. This was the Cordero Patterson phenomenon when he was a rookie. He scored 100-yard touchdowns, 80-yard touchdowns. Just couldn't couldn't keep it up. And that's kind of happening with Fields a little bit where he's he's good with his legs, but he's not like rushing 70 yards for TDs and that makes a difference. And their defense isn't good and their passing game isn't good. And I think there there's so many holes with this Bears team. There's really no reason to lose this game at home unless something wacky happens like, oh, I don't know, being minus three in the take give. Yeah, a hundred percent. And and I had to pull it up because you mentioned the Lions. One in six they started last year. They yeah. go on to rip out eight of their last ten. Unbelievable stretch right there. That started November 6th, week nine. Um, so you're spot on with that one. You're right. That's right when they started turning around, right around this time of year. The Bears, the one thing, you mentioned a few flashback games, how, yes, the Vikings have kind of, quote unquote, dominated the series the last four or five years, even though, again, on paper, a box score doesn't really do it justice. These games have been close. You know, you look at last year, again, Cam Dantzler strips that ball out. Uh, against Amir Smith-Marset, that's the difference right there. But Fields is driving to go win the game, you know, in the final seconds. Mm -hmm. I'm a little worried that we haven't seen the best Bears team yet because this year and during the offseason, their offensive line got better. They added a huge major weapon in the passing game in DJ Moore. And we just haven't seen all the pieces put together yet for the Bears. You know, the 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 first time we play the Bears this uh, this year, obviously Justin Fields gets knocked out early in that game. And obviously, as you mentioned, Tyson Badgett has to come in and kind of try to rescue them out of this kind of hole that that they were kind of dug in, so, so to speak, those mm -hmm. first, I don't know, quarter and a half of that game. But I'm worried that we haven't seen the best of the bears yet, but on paper, when they're all healthy, I think, again, this team's going to be pretty competitive. My hope for the Vikings would be that the bears empty the clip trying to beat the lions on sure. the road. Yep. Lions, arguably a better team than the Vikings probably are a better team than the Vikings. They go and they play absolutely out of their minds for 55 minutes and they lose in the final five minutes. I mean, that, that might've been their chance to lose that game and then to come back on the road after the holiday and try to do that again against a Vikings team in a tough environment. I don't know if they have it in them. We'll find out. We'll find out also. And likewise, are the Vikings going to stub their toe in prime time, two games in a row, like the way they did against the Broncos. I find that a little hard to believe. I just think the law of averages works in the Vikings favor in a couple senses here. Do they get Justin Jefferson back, Luke? That is the next question I have for you because we're going now on six games, Sands Jefferson, and the Vikings have been really keeping their head above water without him. I think Schefter projected that he would be back for this game, but some of the, the commentary around this has not, they have given no assurances that he'll play. He's going after people on Twitter saying, hey, my health is more important than your fantasy football team. That was just earlier today. I think signs point toward another benching for Jefferson, you know, uh, coach's decision and hold him, holding him through the bye. I, I kind of don't think he plays again. I want to, here's where I want to start this one, because I was lis listening to some local sports talk radio the other day. The host brought mm -hmm. this up and I just want to ask you, because we really haven't talked about this part of JJ yet. And this injury, yeah. this looming thing, he brought up the contract and asked if this, 
this vacancy had anything to do with the contract because on paper, man, hammies, four to six weeks. I mean, that's the norm. We're approaching week seven now, and you're telling me that's a maybe now too, maybe even leaning, no, he's not going to play. Unless there was a setback we don't know about, it just definitely feels like he should have been back by now. So is there a real chance this extended absence, so to speak, has anything to do with the contract that they, they didn't get done in the offseason. Like, how much do you think that is coming into play here? 5%, 10%, 90%? I mean, it's week seven now of this injury. Yeah, boy, it is really hard to, to know because everything that's been said by Jefferson, mm -hmm. you know, I think he's saying the right things. I don't think he's made any sign that it's contract related. I think the Vikings have very much played this as we want him healthy for the stretch run, which makes sense to me. This is a coaching staff that treats injuries fairly cautiously. So I think this tracks with that. Um, but it'd be hard to say it doesn't play in at all. Because if you try to come back and you're Jefferson and you get re-injured, then I think there's even more of maybe a stigma of, okay, well, this guy, when he does get hurt, he has a hard time returning healthy. Like, you don't want that souring any of the negotiations for next year. Like, if you, if he, you know, struggled to get through the year on that hamstring, wasn't 100%, didn't look his best. Yeah, that might leave a bad taste in the, in the team's mouth. And you go into the offseason for these intense negotiations from a place of weakness. And I don't think he wants that. I think the team is trying to do right by him. So I, I think generally you handle assets this valuable with kid gloves. And the Vikings are doing that to some extent. And it might be to everybody's benefit. They might get the best possible version of Justin Jefferson in December. That's good. He might keep his value high. That's good for him. Might be good for everybody. Don't you remember, Luke? Not in a negotiation year, certainly, mm -hmm. like with, the, with Thielen. But do you remember how hard it was for Adam Thielen to come back from a hamstring injury when he tried to do it too early. Yes. That was pain, painful yes. to watch. Mm -hmm. Painful to watch. And he really never got healthy until, ironically, the playoff came against New Orleans where he looked fantastic. But it took him from like week six until then to look like the normal guy. So I think they're just being super cautious with a really valuable piece of their franchise. Is that kind of how you would ah. read it? I, I think you hit it right on the head. I don't have a, a lot to add. I'll just echo again. Out of all the injuries, hammies can definitely linger. And it's one of those, like you brought up the perfect example. We saw it uh, firsthand with Adam Thielen. You do not want to put this guy in jeopardy for the long term. The big picture. This is a guy that there's probably one, maybe two guys on every team, all 32 teams that you could get away with this and try to, again, put the kid gloves on, so to speak. Every other guy on the team, all 51 other guys on the roster, it's like, we got to win this week. It's it's crunch time. It's playoff mode. Uh, do or die time. JJ's a guy that you hope is going to be on this franchise for 10, 15 total years. You look back in a couple of years, what's one more week, right? And when it comes down to that, um, you don't want to jeopardize the long-term health of this man. And I think, again, I think they're doing it the right way. Again, I just, it, that question was posed and brought up. And as weeks go on here, and again, they have that perfect bye week coming up one more. It's like, ah, well, why not wait one more week then and then get him fully healthy, 100%, full green light those last five games. But um, it just seemed like the contract, ah, the, the longer time goes on, Sam, that that contract starts to creep up in the back of people's mind. Is that, is it a contract thing? I mean, he should have been back by now. We were hoping, some people were hoping he'd be back by week four, the earliest possible. Mm -hmm. We didn't know the severity. So it's just been very long and drawn out. And I think some fans and people are, are maybe just uh, getting a little tired, I guess, and just want the full answer and kind of peek behind the curtain, so to speak, of exactly what's going on with JJ. Is he okay? There, there certainly should be optimism, though, that his return brings something extra out of Josh Dobbs, gets this offense to an even better spot, that there might be still some meat left on the bone here that we're not even seeing yet. And that could be the wild card that comes around here in December and turns the Vikings from fringe playoff team maybe into a plucky playoff contender even with josh Dobbs at the helm you can look forward to that because i think when he does come back after this much time that he is going to be probably firing on all cylinders the other curious one luke that i've heard nothing about 
And I don't know if it's even really been asked about. Marcus Davenport, he hasn't played since the previous Bears game. So that would that was week six. So six, so seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So this is six weeks now with no sign of him returning. Practice window hasn't opened up. So again, maybe this is a Jordan Hicks situation. Maybe this is something where they try to get him back for the final game or playoff game, if at all. But man, Marcus Davenport's absence. And thank goodness for DJ Wanham, you know, somewhat stepping up in his absence. And I think that that's gone better than I would have expected. But a disappointing season for that one-year deal that has not worked out at all. Uh, obviously both of us cover the team, right? We, we're on the mm-hmm. Twitter Vikings uh, thread all day, 24 seven. Do you remember two, three weeks ago? I had to bring him up because I, I hadn't heard a word. Like you mentioned, nobody's mentioned this guy. I said, wait a minute. I, I haven't heard a peep about this guy. Is this guy in the IR? Is that why I haven't heard anything? What's going on? Is it, is it a four to six week kind of thing? Because it is really weird. And the fact that you're right, they've only got, what, two and a half games out of this, man. This this was one of your, quote-unquote, prize free agents, Sam, right? They, they let a lot of big key mm-hmm. veterans go. They sign a couple guys back. But then the big two guys were Byron Murphy and Marcus Davenport. That's all we heard about all offseason, all training camp was those two guys. Then he starts the preseason injured. Then finally... He gets healthy. You see some flashes, and and that's almost the most frustrating part, Sam. You get the tease, right? Like you see how much better this defense, this front seven, this defensive line plays when he is out there and healthy. Um, but unfortunately, you're right, man. And, and we knew going in, there was a reason he was even available. Former first round pick, just never fully put it together in New Orleans because of the injuries. The consistency has been a big issue when healthy. All the raw physical traits, all the talent coming out of UTSA, but. Um, yeah, it's been frustrating for sure. And, you know, th- the bigger thing that I remember looking up and talking to you guys, Luke Brown, Arif, everybody, um, mm-hmm. around when they signed him, there's a lot of dead money they're going to have to eat next year if they don't bring him back, which is, I'm assuming they don't, um, just, just pending kind of how this is all played out. But um, I think it's close to 13 mil they have to eat next year. Don't quote me on that exact number, but it's close to double digits. And that's a hefty price tag for a front office in Kwesi who's in year two going into year three that's still trying to dig his way out of the Rick Spielman regime and the mess that he kind of left behind for, for Kwesi. Um, So, yeah, it, it's been very frustrating, pretty disappointing. And again, kind of a tease because when he's been out there, mm-hmm. boy, uh, it's been exciting. Yeah, he signed this one-year deal to rebuild his stock. Correct. And he might need to do it again, whether it's with the Vikings or with someone else. He might need another bridge deal to kind of hit free agency with some from a position of strength because now the injury's creeping up once again for him. It's already been a problem, and uh, I doubt he signs a very substantial deal in free agency unless he comes back in the final couple games looking really good. I want to talk Just wide real quick. Dead cap, Marcus Davenport, 10.1. 10.1 on the dead cap. You think about Kirk Cousins, that whole situation, 28 mil dead cap. Boy, that's a lot of dead money you're paying out of the owner's pockets for players who aren't even going to play a single down for you. Um, again, just in this transition. I mean, some teams do that, sure, uh, You know, when, when they're close to Super Bowl or bust kind of territory. To be in year two going into year three of this new regime, Boy, that's a lot of dead money. That that just surprised me. That's all. And, and you kind of just reminded me of that. Uh, let's talk wide receiver depth chart. We're also, also going to hear from Ron Johnson before the show is done. And the future of the defense, if Brian Flores moves on. All coming up on the Minnesota Football Party. But first, a word from prize picks. You want to have some fun? You want to have some fun playing daily fantasy sports? Well, the largest DFS platform in North America is Prize Picks. They're easy to play. They're exciting. Way better than the traditional DFS you're used to. It's just you against the numbers, not a pool of thousands and thousands of pros and sharks that are going to try to take your money. Instead of battling all of them, you pick more or less than the two to six player stat projections, and then you watch the winnings roll in. You can go same sport. You can go like Christian McCaffrey rushing yards and Patrick Mahomes passing touchdowns, or you can go cross sport with combo projections from football to basketball. Maybe you take Josh Dobbs passing yards and Carl Anthony Towns three point shots. 
Wolves are hot right now. Fun to wager on. Uh, LeBron James and Travis Kelsey. There's a star-studded cross-sport combo. Prize Picks even offers a reboot policy. Well, the reboot policy allows your entries to stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. For football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half, does not return, that player is rebooted. Prize Picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy that is so great for the player. Go to prizepicks.com slash locked on. Use code locked on NFL for a first deposit match up to $100. So easy. You pick the players and the stats you want. Highlight your winnings from prize picks. It is so fun and simple. And you can go to prizepicks.com slash locked on NFL. Use code locked on NFL for a first deposit match up to $100. Going back to the Jefferson conversation, Luke, one guy who I've really been impressed with stepping up in his absence, Mr. Brandon Powell, Mm. an afterthought when he was signed, a camp body, a player that would be on the fringes of the 53-man roster. And yet, here he is. He's been an impact wide receiver, In several games, he's been your second best option at wide receiver. And I even wonder, Luke, when Jefferson comes back, how much they're going to keep him in the rotation because of how well he's played. You've got KJ Osborne, obviously, to get snaps. You've got Powell. You've got Addison. What do you think about Brandon Powell's emergence in this offense? Uh, Man, I remember back in training camp, right? The first week, the first 10 days, it was the Jalen Naylor show. Those last two weeks, people forget. You came back from practice twice a week on this show, and you said, this Brandon Powell guy, man, he keeps producing. He, he keeps making big catches, big plays. Uh, listen, nobody loves K.J. Osborne more than you and I do. I mean, you were one of the first people on the K.J. Yeah. train. Fifth-round pick from Miami, works his way up, grinds his way through special teams, practice squad, all that, works his way onto the first team, finds a way to make plays when given opportunities. Another great day three find from the Spielman regime that – You've got your money's worth out of exponentially at this point. Having said that, you look at his production the last three years, 2021, 655 yards, 2022, 650 yards, this year, 2023. And yes, I know he's missed a few games, but currently on pace for 614 yards. So we all love KJ. I mean, he definitely gives fans a sense, a a vibe of the Jarius Wright role as that wide receiver three. And I think there'll always be a place for him on any team. All 32 teams he plays for as that third, maybe fourth guy without a doubt. But I also think it's fair to have a real discussion about the fact that he may be kind of plateauing a bit, especially when you look at the stats and and that we kind of know who he is and who he isn't more so at this point. There's definitely a ceiling to his game, in my opinion, physically, athletically. He's kind of maxed out in that sense. And I'm not saying Brandon Powell gives you anything extra or more than he does athletically, but I do think if there's a plan to let KJ Osborne walk next year, which it feels like there is, if that's already in the works, Maybe it's wise to see exactly what you got with Powell as the number three guy for a few games to see if you think he could be that guy next year for 2024 because you don't want to get to the offseason, Sam, and still be unsure, still have questions, right? You want to have your mind made up already. And so I think you do have to give him a fair share of looks and snaps in that role so you can make a fair assessment and evaluation, not so much for this year, but for next year and beyond, because Powell, I I mean, he's earned the right to be on the field. I know that he's made enough plays in this offense, but whether it's KJ or Powell up first, when JJ gets back, I don't know. I don't really care. I'd expect things to at least start back out the same way as they were before the first week or two, but by season's end, I do hope we at least get a few looks at JJ number one, Addison number two, and Powell number three, all on the field together, healthy, running at full speed. So the coaches, the front office, even the fans know they got a snapshot, so to speak, of what it could look like next year if they want to bring him back to replace KJ Osborne, if in fact he does leave in free agency. That's just my two cents on it. Yeah. I mean, for a wide receiver question like this, we got to bring in the wide receiver himself, Ron Johnson. He's at three Ron Johnson on X. He hosts the Ron Johnson show here on Locked On Sports Minnesota. Uh, Ron, coming to us from beautiful Des Moines, Iowa. Welcome in. We're just talking about wide receiver depth and tossing around the idea of, uh, hey, KJ Osborne's a free agent. You might have to extend Jefferson. 
So you probably have to operate at a budget with the with the rest of your receivers. Jordan Addison comes cheap, rookie contract. Maybe Brandon Powell is an option for the future going forward. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, Brandon Powell has to be consistent, and I think that's the key is, like, can he continuously do this the rest of the season? Uh, we saw flashes of speed, the, the one slant ton of tunnel route he caught and got vertical extremely fast. Um, he didn't go north and south. He kind of Tyreek Hill a bit and stuck his foot in the ground and just, I mean, he was moving at a different speed than the rest of the defenders. And so if he can do that every single week moving forward, I could easily see them – parting ways with K.J. Osborne because of Jordan Addison, because of Justin Jefferson, because of T.J. Hawkinson. Honestly, there's no room for four. There is room for three, and I think the three are Addison, Jefferson, Hawkinson. The fourth guy usually has to be a guy of value, and when I say a value, of money value as well as on the field value. And I think Brandon Powell does that. He also is your punt returner. Uh, he can also return mm -hmm. kicks if you need them. Um, and so I think that's that's the key is like he's kind of taking KJ's spot as punt returner. Um, KJ on the field hasn't done a ton this season uh, that we thought we'd see because Jordan Addison is what we thought he would be. Um, it, it, it There was times where um, you just didn't know because Justin Jefferson was getting it all. And then all of a sudden he goes out and then you see kind of a little bit of an emergence of TJ Hogginson with uh, Jordan Addison. You throw Justin Jefferson back in there. They do have a true three-way threat of any three of these guys can, can make a big play. And then Brandon Powell just becomes your additional jet sweep guy, uh, your, your choice route guy. And then you saw it. You saw him in late moments being wide open when it's third and long, catching the ball, getting up the field, and getting some necessary yards. Um, so, yeah, from a dollar standpoint, the fact that K.J. Osborne probably can go somewhere else and get paid a little bit more than he would with the Vikings, I could see that happening. Hey, Ron, looking back, so much was made when Quasey traded for T.J. Hawkinson. Some loved it, some hated it, some couldn't believe this guy's trading within the division again, something you typically don't see from GMs throughout the league. Now that we're here, though, week 12, full year later, in your opinion, was that the single greatest move Quasey has made since he's been here? And then part two on that, do you think Hawkinson could go down as the greatest Viking tight end of all time when it's all said and done? Uh, the greatest tight end, that's always going to be a debate. I saw Shannon Sharp just say, is he one of the greatest tight ends of all time? And he said, no. Um, he put Travis Kelsey up there, Antonio Gates. Uh, I forgot the other two line or tight ends he put up there, but he didn't put himself. Oh, Gronk was the other one, uh, but he didn't put himself up there. And then Gonzalez. And so Shannon Sharp even saying like, well, I mean, I, I, I've done everything I could do, you know, at this level. I, I've got Super Bowls. I've got money. Um, he, he said, I wouldn't trade my career for anybody else's. That's going to be, you know, we'll see. Kyle Rudolph right now has the crown. TJ Hawkinson is a different receiver version of, of, of Kyle Rudolph. Kyle Rudolph was more of a bigger bodied tight end where TJ Hawkinson gives you true route running. Um, we don't know. Cause I mean, is he going to spend 10 years with the Vikings? Maybe not. Um, and so it, it's, it's all down to how long he spends here, uh, for that. As far as, um, the uh, TJ Hawkinson move from a Quasi standpoint, uh, I'd say, yeah, it's one of his better moves. I still like, I think Jordan Addison is a great one. I think getting Dalton Reisner late is a great one. Um, you know, I, I don't know if I'll say that's the greatest move he's made so far, uh, but it's one of it's one of his top ones. I mean, it was definitely something necessary. Uh, clearly, you see they needed it. TJ Hawkinson. Uh, being one of the top targeted weapons on third down in the NFL, uh, not just for tight ends, but for receivers, period. Uh, he, he's really become a staple to not just Kirk Cousins, because it was Kirk Cousins earlier who was getting it to him, and now Josh Dobbs. Um, if not for some turnovers, some misplays, some missed calls, the Vikings are, are what, seven and four? Mm -hmm. um, and it, it just feels a little bit different uh, when you talk about the moves of TJ Hawkinson and Quasey. But right now, after a loss, uh, everybody's going to nitpick every single piece of this team. Uh, and, you know, some people could say, was it worth it to spend the money on him when you know you have Justin Jefferson Nassin? I mean, there's you can go back and forth on that when it comes to money. Uh, and then also with all these contracts, the salary cap is going to go up every year. But how long can they sustain a big time Justin Jefferson contract? Because it has to come a big time Christian Darrison, con Darisaw contract and a TJ Hawkinson contract. 
Mm -hmm. You 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 got to sacrifice Daniil or somebody on the defense, or you got to sacrifice Kirk Cousins. So there's a lot of big contracts looming. Where this used to be a defensive led big contract team with just Kirk Cousins up there, and now you're kind of see the tide turn because when they did give money to Stephon Diggs and Adam Thielen, slowly they start saying, "All right, let's let's trade this guy, let's move on from this guy." Um, and, and now you know, and, and they were comfortable with giving big time defensive dollars. Now this has become a big time offensive dollar led team, and so we'll see if that's the recipe for success with a defense that just does what they're doing, which is stay in the top 15. Mm -hmm. Well, right now that defense led by Brian Flores is absolutely getting banged for its buck because it's not a high budget defense. Flores is squeezing every bit of talent out of it. But Ron, have you let your mind drift at all to a future without Brian Flores? Because I don't think it's a secret that he wants to be a head coach again. He could get that shot as early as this offseason. Have you thought about what could happen if he leaves? Would we be able to continue the scheme without him? Uh, yeah, no. Uh, this is the thing, man. Like, uh, 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 flattery or whatever. What do they say? Uh, copying is the best form of flattery or whatever, however that saying goes. Mm -hmm. um, when you copy somebody, you're just saying, hey, like, I really love it. And so people will try to, to, to copy it. I just don't know if they understand his system when you look at some of the blitzes he's dialed up, some of the uh, three safety coverages he's dialed up. The one thing about Ed Donatel we always said was he could not manufacture pressure. Brian Flores is manufacturing pressure because he's not getting just flat out Daniil Hunter greatness and flat out DJ Warnham greatness. They do have moments. But if you watch some of these plays, I mean, he's getting guys one on one with the center and it's your safety or he's getting his other corner one on one with a tackle. I mean, he's getting his nickel one on one with a guard like he's just he's manufacturing guys moving. He's doing tackle in twists with a safety as the tackle like he has uh Mattel is coming down playing basically D tackle and then he's twisting with DJ Wanham and getting him home because he's just bumping the tackle just enough to not be considered like a pull or a grab uh not to be considered like a, a, a illegal move he's just playing his game and so Brian Flores leaving I, I I would say two years I think at least he has to give it one more year uh just to dip off after year one I feel like that would be uh, a little bit overzealous. Uh, I, I think he, I don't know if he would feel like the process is really set for the way it should be. And then what team is out there? Like, honestly, this is the one thing. I, if it's the Patriots, like if the Patriots do just decide to move him from Belichick because they just feel like he's old, he's not getting anything out of these young players anymore. He doesn't have the same respect he had for the younger days of the Tom Brady's and the Teddy Bruskies. Um, I could see him jumping ship. For the Patriots. I mean, that's a yeah. that's a coveted job. That's an ownership group that's willing to ride the ups and the downs of a head coach. Um, Brian Flores has, you know, ties there. So I could see him going to the Patriots. Um, the other possible jobs, I just don't see it being worth it. Uh, we think about the Giants and they both might come open. I don't know if that's worth it because they don't have the pieces where the, the, the Patriots kind of have the pieces and they and they, you know, I think the biggest piece they're missing maybe is a quarterback. Um, and who knows if the Vikings don't sign Josh Dobbs as head coach, Brian Flores, bring Josh Dobbs into the Patriots to be his coach <laughs> on a true. So this is the thing. If you remember any given Sunday, I don't want to ruin it for the people that haven't seen it. But at the end, there's a move. I'm not going to say where with a coach and a quarterback in that movie with a different franchise. So not bearing the lead, but just, just, just watch out for that too. If Brian Flores does want to go to the pages and take Josh Dobbs with him, because the Vikings want to sit on Kirk Cousins. Hey, New England currently projected to have the third overall pick as well. Maybe a Drake May situation there. If Caleb Williams and Marvin Harrison go one and two, something to think about. Uh, real quick here, Ron, what scares you about the Bears? I was talking to Sam earlier to open the show. When Justin Fields is healthy, yeah, year two of Matt Eberflus. They're not winning games, but when, when Fields is healthy now with DJ Moore, they are competitive. What scares you about this Bears matchup this week? Yeah, we had Alex Brown on the Ron Johnson show, former Bears DN, uh, Florida Gator standout. And he brought up a great point that I didn't even realize or think about that Luke Getze is kind of coaching for his job because he's coaching for the team to show he can get a he has a he's a competent coordinator and he could he could he could turn water into wine with this team. 
but he's also coaching to show the organization Justin Fields is okay, but I don't know if he's my guy. And so that's where Alex Brown seems to think if Luke Getze doesn't get the best out of Justin Fields, what are the Bears going to do? Are they going to stick by Fields or are they going to stick by Getze? Are they going to go out and get – because I even asked him, I'm like, hey, if you guys have the top two picks or top one of the two picks, do you take a quarterback or do you take Marvin Harrison Jr.? And he literally said it depends on who's offensive coordinator. And I think that's going to be the key. If Luke gets he's a mm-hmm. quarter, co- coordinator, they probably do go get a quarterback. They probably do go get Caleb Williams or Drake May uh, in that early first two picks. Um, but if they decide to move on from Luke Getze, and I mean, there's a lot of bright minds out there as far as court. I mean, look at the Buffalo Bills. I'm pretty – or sorry, not Buffalo Bills. The uh, Miami Dolphins. I'm pretty sure the Miami Dolphins quarterback coach, receivers coach, there's going to be people reaching out to them like, hey, you know, can you can you put Mike McDaniel's offense together out here? Um, when you look at that, like that, that could be an opportunity, uh, for them. And so if that happens, you know, do, do they, do they then go get a different coordinator and say, look, man, go make, how can you make Justin Fields good? Like, can you make, I mean, even the Eagles, like if you look at the Eagles coordinators, um, like Rick, Nick, uh, whatever, Gannon or whatever is not the guy. Like he doesn't have the pieces in, 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 uh, uh, with the Cardinals that he had with the Eagles. So that showing is more Nick Sirianni than anything. Um, but when you think about where they could end up, I, I could see the bears, like, like the bears scares me because Luke Getzey, uh, if he does figure this out and does get Justin Fields out of the pocket, they're extremely tough. And he and Justin feels like rolling out to his left. There's a couple plays from the Lions game. He looks good. Like he's hitting guys on stride. He's making the right play. He's hitting the right throw. Um, so that's what's a little scary is like depending on what Luke gets, he gets done. He scares me because if he decides to say, hey, look, I want to be here. Let's make this work. We're going to go draft Marvin Harrison for you next year. That could be scary because he's then going to do everything to give Justin Fields an opportunity to win where early on Justin Fields said it, he was thinking too much. They, he felt like they weren't letting him be him. They were trying to make him somebody else. Mm-hmm. Ron, in closing, people are probably watching this, getting ready for their Thanksgiving meals. Lay out the menu for the Johnson family Thanksgiving feast. Yeah. What's the power rankings? Yeah. So we got uh, of course a honey baked ham from Minnesota. Mm. Uh, you know, we went and got the honey baked ham from Minnesota uh, we have a fried turkey. Mm. Uh, we have a smoked turkey. Uh, I'm going to throw some bacon. So this is the, the secret. Throw some bacon on top of the turkey as it's finishing the smoke at the end. Mm. So you kind of put some bacon in the oven. You don't want it to get crispy. You still want it to be a little bit soft, but you want it to kind of almost be almost cooked. And then you throw it on top of the turkey because you'll get that bacon grease to soak into the turkey now. Ooh. So you can take a, a like it's, it's it's called a bacon weave. My boy Spice does this. If you go to Spice mm. uh, Adams Instagram, you'll see it. You take the bacon and you weave it like a blanket and you make like a flat layer of bacon. And then you take that, you throw that over the top of the turkey towards the end of the smoking. So mm. uh, we'll start smoking it, I think tomorrow morning you want to smoke it for about eight hours Mm -hmm. uh and then you throw the bacon on top of that and then you get that that bacon soaked in but then the bacon keeps cooking so you can have a little bacon with your turkey when you cut it Mm. you got that then you got the sweet potatoes you got the uh yams uh you got greens you got uh um what are those things called the little brussels sprouts my mm-hmm. wife does like a brussels sprout deal in a crock pot it's absolutely like i was not a brussels sprout fan until she started making it that way uh i love it, it has like a little bit of soy sauce with like this i don't know what kind of it's like a barbecue almost but it's like soy sauce and barbecue mm. with the uh that and then we got you know my my mother-in-law makes the homemade roll so she started today she makes them she lets them rise to the perfect height Throws them in there. And then for breakfast, we're going to have the, uh, she does a uh, French toast uh, mm. in fresh French toast that she lets sit overnight in the garage. And then she then in the garage refrigerator, she brings it in, she puts them in the oven and then it's baked French toast. So it's, it's, it's delicious. So you're in Des Moines. Is that right? So uh, yeah, I could yeah. be in the car within an hour and then uh, be down there. Yeah. By about, yeah. Uh, by the way, I no just problem. looked on FanDuel. So that's the one thing about being down here. I'm oh trying to, yeah. So, so, so tweet it out. If fans have any picks they want me to take, I got, I got, uh, I still got $50 in bonus bets. I haven't used and I still have $136 in winnings. Uh, that I might throw to a couple bets. I, I might do like a, a, I've never done this before, but I think I'm going to do this like a six 
team parlay for mm-hmm. basketball and then maybe another one for football. So it makes my entire Thanksgiving football. Love it. Like I have to watch them all. So starting with the Lions, I'm taking the Lions. And then from there, I got to figure out. Because the Lions, who are they playing on Thanksgiving? Packers. 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 Yeah. So yeah. I'm taking the Lions in my first parlay team. That's an easy one. And then I got to figure out the rest from there. Um, guessing I'm probably going to take the Vikings on the Monday night. So I'm going to start my parlay with the, the 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 Lions and finish it with the Vikings on Monday. Hopefully, I've hit all five, and then I'm just waiting for the Vikings to win. And it's not one of those all I needed was one team to finish out a great parlay, and then the, the Vikings let me down on Monday night. Yeah. I, I would recommend, so you got Lions, I would say Cowboys, I would say Seahawks, home underdogs. I would say Dolphins over Jets. Mm. And then if you toss in the Vikings in there, I'm looking at it right now. That would be a, where'd it go? Where'd the Vikings go? Come on. There they are. Um, That would be a healthy plus 2,400. So bet 10, win win 246 right there. Ooh, I might bet 20 on that then. That's (laughs) Why stop there? Yeah. Ooh, why not go 50? Just do the whole $50 bonus on that. Put all the bonus bets on might it. There all you the, go. Because it said I have 50 left from the bonus bet, so I might throw 50 in there. Ooh, that might be a nice one there. A little five, six team parlay. Yeah, I've never done it, but I always see people do it. Yeah. So th- this might be the one. And then uh, watch the Packers like let me down. The Packers might beat the Lions, and the Lions are going to line on Thanksgiving and just let me down to start it. Well, hey, I don't I'm know. If, I don't know. Line. I'm not going to do any special lines. I'm just going to. Put it yeah. on the money line over under. Okay, that's always what kills me too is the over or yeah. the money line because they yeah. still have to win by the number of points they were supposed to win by. Right. So yeah, that might be a fun one to keep me uh, engaged. All yeah, I'm gonna put that mm-hmm. down. I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna tweet it out for all the fans. I'm gonna tag Locked On Sports and FanDuel. Love it. Ron's Thanksgiving parlay. Beautiful. The one thing I know about sixteen parlays, they never lose. They win every time. That that's yeah, what, what can go wrong. That's what Twitter tells me. Yeah. Yeah. People only post when they win. That's hey. right. That is true. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Ron, have a happy Thanksgiving, my friend. We'll talk to you, you on the other too. side. Definitely. See you, Ron. See you, Ron. Ron Johnson, at three Ron Johnson, on what we used to affectionately call Twitter. Uh, we're going to do our picks on FanDuel when we come back. No Luke Braun, no Arif. There's our names. Uh, but we will get their picks in. They did responsibly send them to me, so I will uh, include those. Luke Braun is actually the first picker today, and this is big for Luke Braun because Luke Braun has fallen behind by a wide margin. Inman, you won last week or two weeks ago. Arif won last week. I won the week before that. So all three of us have a recent win. Luke Braun is fledgling. His bank rolled down to 405. So this week, he tries to mount his comeback by picking Vikings winning margin one to 13 points. That's what he kicks it off with. Um, Arif Hassan is up next. He sent me his picks in order. He goes Dolphins minus nine and a half. That's the Black Friday game against the Jets. So then we go to me, yours truly. Um, I am going to select the Seahawks plus seven. I, I think home dogs in a tough place to play. I love that line at worst. You push, you lose by a touchdown. I'll take the Seahawks uh, coming off a tough loss, needing a victory against the 49ers. Luke Inman make two picks. So Luke Braun, he picked the Vikings to win one to 13. So does that mean that game is out? Could I pick the bears? Cause I've been pumping up the bears all show long. I kind of like the Chicago plus three and a half. Is that available? I think if you're taking, yeah, you're taking a different. The opposite. Uh, yeah. And it's yeah. not really the same bet. It's not like you're taking Bears t- 1 through 13. So, yeah, just Bears spread. Uh, I can respect that. Okay. So, lock me in. Bears plus three and a half. Hate to do it. Never do it. But again, been pumping the Bears up all show long. All right. Then with my second bet, player prop, I'm going to come back with David Montgomery. Anytime touchdown score, I just feel it. Thanksgiving Day at home. He's been red hot. He's their goal line guy. That's at minus 145. Give me one second here. Go ahead, Sam. Punch in your pick. I'll get those odds up here for you as well. You betcha. Um, So I've got Seahawks plus seven. I'm going to couple that with, I'm just on the CJ Stroud bandwagon. I want to see Stroud 
and Lawrence get into an absolute aerial battle. I'm going to take Stroud over 267 and a half passing yards. That, along with the Seahawks, is a modest plus 261. And I'll stick with the minimum 120 because I am leading and I don't want to jeopardize that. So let's go. Uh, plus or uh, 120 at plus 261. And then I'll go 125 on my wager. Five more than the minimum. 125. That wins 269.87. Just call it 270, Sam. Keep it simple. 270. All right. That's 125 to win 270? Correct. Correct. All right. Sounds good. Um, Arif Hassan goes Jordan Love under 228 and a half passing yards. I feel like that's always a good bet. And uh, Luke Braun goes Jordan Addison over receiving yards. Jordan Addison over receiving yards. I'll calculate those odds here in a minute uh, after the show. But those are the picks this week via FanDuel. We appreciate FanDuel. We appreciate all of you viewers and listeners here on the Minnesota Football Party. Uh, Luke Inman, real quick, your very uh, quick power rankings. Thanksgiving fair tomorrow. Boy, I'm a plain Jane guy. Give me a uh, turkey, mashed potatoes, gravy, some green beans, stuffing, and just you got to have that roll, Sam, to scoop it all up at the end. That, that's me. And then maybe a little, maybe not a little, maybe a lot of pumpkin pie afterwards for my sweet tooth. But that's it, man. I've got the mother-in-law buffet coming my way tomorrow. Okay. In Hibbing, Minnesota. It's going to be, uh, I'm going to have to loosen the belt a little bit, you know, after the, after that one, that's going to be a lot of football, a lot of food, probably a lot of snacking along the way too. um, little, little wine to cap it off at night. I'm looking forward to it. Um, so have a gluttonous Thanksgiving to you, Luke, cause I certainly will. And, uh, we'll talk to you on the other side, Minnesota football party, Vikings bears, even more in depth preview on Monday leading up to that game. Big thanks to Ron Johnson as well. Happy holiday. And we'll talk to you next time.